You don't hear very much about it these days, but the Pentagon-operated prison at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, remains open. And now, new details involving Gina Haspel's covert past seem to place her at the notorious prison in the early days of the so-called War on Terror. Over the 17 long years of the prison's use for detention of prisoners merely suspected of having something to do with terrorism, 780 men have passed through its walls. Today, 40 of those men remain. Some of them, like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, known as KSM, the alleged mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, passed through a secret CIA-operated outpost within the military base known as a black site. Although we are told that the CIA black site program has now ended, it was revealed last month that the current CIA director, Haspel, may have had a stint running a CIA outpost at Guantanamo. This is according to a recently declassified transcript from a secret court hearing last year, during which Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's defense lawyer argued that Haspel's past involvement at the prison makes a fair trial impossible. We know about this story from the dogged and important work of Miami Herald reporter Carol Rosenberg. She is the only reporter covering Guantanamo Bay full-time. She was there in 2002 when the first 20 detainees arrived. Today, under the Trump administration, more than half of the men who remain at Gitmo are still being held indefinitely without a charge or any trial in the near horizon. When the first 20 men from various countries arrived at Guantanamo, blindfolded, shackled, kept in outdoor cages, Carol Rosenberg was there from day one. She's been reporting on this very unique beat for close to two decades, and she's done an incredible public service, reporting daily the events unfolding in this secretive world, from the treatment of prisoners, their names and stories, to the complicated military trials. Carol has reported on every aspect of life at Guantanamo. She was just hired by the New York Times, in fact, to continue to work on this vital story about this dark chapter in U.S. history. Carol Rosenberg, thanks for joining us on Intercepted. Not a problem. So I want to start from the very beginning. Explain how you started covering the Guantanamo prison. Quite honestly, the Pentagon outfit down here in Miami, the Southern Command, which I had developed a reporting relationship with, called me up and said, we're getting into the prison business. Are you interested in coming along? Before the prisoners ever arrived, as you may recall, um, Donald Rumsfeld was at the Pentagon podium talking about how they were just overwhelmed with these prisoners in Afghanistan after the invasion and that they were looking for an alternative site to put them. I, I, I would characterize Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, um, as the least worst place we could have selected. And he mentioned Guam or Guantanamo, and the Guantanamo mention sort of lit lights here at the Herald. What was the strategy? What would have been the benefit of taking prisoners from one side of the world, flying them to Guantanamo in the Western Hemisphere? Why not hold them elsewhere or take them into the federal justice system in the United States to put them on trial for their connection to terrorism. There was no suggestion at that moment that these were criminals. These men were held as the equivalent of prisoners of war in an irregular war. So they didn't call them POWs. They called them enemy combatants. They weren't initially planning to charge people. They were, re quote unquote, removing them from the battlefield to uh, make them available for what became, you know, these horribly harsh and cruel interrogations. It, once we've uh, interviewed them and figured out what kind of intelligence information they have, if other countries uh, of their nationality are interested in having them for the purpose of prosecution for their behavior, and we'll keep them off the streets so that they don't go right back and start flying airplanes into our buildings and killing thousands of Americans, um, my At the very beginning, these planes arrived with these men and young boys who had been captured in Pakistan and in parts of Afghanistan by Pakistanis and allies and handed over to the Americans. If you close your eyes and imagine a photo of 20 men on their knees in orange jumpsuits with blinders on their face, that's a picture taken the first day by a Navy combat cameraman of the first 20 men in. 700 men have come through Gitmo since the beginning of the war on terror when these pictures of shackled and hooded men shocked the world. 
Some say past allegations of waterboarding and hunger strikes have turned this place into a terrorist recruiter's dream. And what remains at Guantanamo today, if you're interested, is 40 detainees, five of whom are cleared for arrangements to go, nine of whom have been charged at these military commissions, and the rest are what we call the forever prisoners. The, the administration calls them law of war prisoners, people who can be held as prisoners of this war for whom there is no one to surrender on the other side. If the war on terror is a war, they are law of war prisoners of that war. They can be held for the duration of whatever constitutes the war on terror. What do we know of what happened to some of these prisoners, these men, before they were taken to Guantanamo, but after they were taken into custody by either U.S. allied forces or were sold to other people? Because not all of them were just taken straight from the Pakistani interlocutors with the U.S. and then put on a plane to Guantanamo. Some of them were had other stops first, including with the CIA. I did an analysis of how many countries they came from where they were captured before they reached Guantanamo. The common denominator was, with the exception of the people who came straight from CIA black sites, they were all fed through Afghanistan, Bagram, but they were captured in places like Thailand, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Mauritania. I think that's a pretty famous, well-known case, right, of Mohammed Uslahi. One of them hit me hard across the face and quickly put the goggles on my eyes, earmuffs on my ears, and a small bag over my head. They tightened the chains around my ankles and my wrists. Afterwards, I started to bleed. I thought they were going to execute me. Some of the cruelest treatment by the U.S. military of a detainee at Guantanamo. I wanted to ask you about one of the recent pieces that you did that relates to Gina Haspel. Of course, Gina Haspel nominated and then confirmed as CIA director nominated by President Trump. And uh, according to the story that you did uh, for McClatchy in conjunction with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, you say that an attorney for the accused architect of the September 11th attacks told a judge in a secret session last year that CIA director Gina Haspel ran a secret agency outpost at Guantanamo. Explain what you know about Gina Haspel and this other agency outpost at Guantanamo. The black sites of Guantanamo are one of the many secrets that the CIA keeps still about the RDI program, the black site program. We know it was there. We don't know who ran it. So there was this secret prison within a prison. In parallel, over at the 9-11 trial... The Pentagon says six detainees at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba being held for the September 11 terrorist attacks may face the death penalty. Among those held at Guantanamo and expected to be charged is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the suspected mastermind of the attack six years ago. They hold these secret sessions in which they discuss classified information, lock out the defendants, lock out the public... And through a lot of effort by, frankly, myself and other reporters and other people who are interested in transparency, we got an accommodation from the court that they would take the transcripts of these secret sessions and unredact the part that was not classified. In the transcript, one of the attorneys for Hajik Muhammad tells the judge, you know, because of the secrecy and all of the... Um, regulations and restrictions on defense attorneys, who, by the way, have these top secret clearances, can know the nation's secrets, are bound to keep them. But because of these additional restrictions, we can't even ask people if they recognize Gina Haspel when she was here running the black sites. And I look at the words on the page and I'm like, Gina Haspel ran a black site at Guantanamo. It's been widely reported that she certainly ran a black site in Thailand. And the Guantanamo episode continues to be, you know, really mysterious. And then I, begin, I go on a mission to try and figure out the truthfulness of this. And as you would know, Jeremy, those who know for sure can't say, but those who know the program have a context where they can talk about it. I'm not saying it's a fact. I'm saying this piece of information was declassified. 
The CIA won't confirm it. They won't deny it. One of the reasons it makes perfect sense is that what they have acknowledged is that she had a number of covert short-term assignments that they will not describe throughout her career, and that would fit perfectly within it. If this is true about Gina Haspel, in your view, what, what is the significance of it now that she is CIA director? Let me answer that, but let me just say one thing. It is well within her power to answer that question. That is not that she is bound by any sort of classification. She just wants to be both the director of the CIA and in solidarity with the people who are still undercover saying, I'm not going to say what I did because then you can feel safe that I'm not going to say what you've done. But the significance would be, and that was the point of the argument in the, in the secret session, is that Whatever they told the people in the black sites is not admissible at a trial, certainly not admissible at a a death penalty trial, and not admissible at a um, military commission. And the defense attorneys who are trying to disqualify statements that these men made as either tortured, unreliable, unlawful, inadmissible, want the details of who did what when, including at Guantanamo. And one of the people that stands between them knowing it and them being able to use it in court is Gina Haspel, who controls what information is made public about the black sites. There has been a lot of debate about what she did. She's a proud member of the agency. She says in her testimony You know, the agency's not getting back into the prison business, the black site business. I can offer you my personal commitment, clearly and without reservation, that under my leadership, on my watch, CIA will not restart a detention and interrogation program. If she is leading an agency that is turning the page on the past and trying to convince those who are concerned about human rights and the rule of law, that we are going forward, I think she should let us know what she did. The CIA black sites there, and who came through there, and what was done there, and where it was done, is a really important chapter. And it bleeds over into these death penalty trials all the time. Hmm. The USS Cole case, is there's a Saudi man named Abdul Rahim al-Nashri who's accused of putting together the bombing of the USS Cole just to remind people, this was in the year 2000 in the Gulf of Aden off of Yemen's coast. You had an attack on a U.S. ship that killed 17 sailors. The charges, which will be translated and served on Mr. al Nashiri, allege facts surrounding his involvement in the attack on the USS Cole in Yemen on October the 12th, 2000. Abdul Rahim al Nashri is brought to Guantanamo and then taken away. And when he comes back in 2006 and is eventually charged and gets attorneys, his attorneys litigate where he they can meet with him. Because one of the arguments is the CIA may have let these people go, given them over to military custody, and allowed them to see lawyers but they are either constantly re-traumatized by what was done to them. He was waterboarded. He was held nude. He was threatened with a drill at his head while he was hooded. He was packed into a a little coffin-style box to drive him mad. And the argument is there are things at Guantanamo that re-traumatize him that make it impossible for him to participate in his defense. The CIA's role at Guantanamo, before they got there and after they got there, according to the defense attorneys, overshadows everything. I'll give you one example. Early on, some years ago, they were doing some oral arguments in the court. The public hears the court on a 40-second delay in case somebody spills a secret, like names an agent who's not, the public can't know. So there's a security officer inside the court who has a kill switch, a mute button, as does the judge. And if something is said, he can hit the button. With the 40-second delay, we hear white noise, and whatever was the national security secret doesn't get spilled. That's the way it's supposed to work. Well, one day, the lawyer for KSM is arguing about access to information about the black sites. There's nothing secret about it, 
But when he utters the title, we don't know this till later, somebody switches off the audio. Someone hits the mute button. And we watch the judge look at the security officer, the security officer look at the judge, and neither of them did it. Somebody outside that court had the ability to silence the court. Have you ever heard of a court where the judge doesn't even know or is not in control of what the public can hear or know? By the end of the week, the judge has ordered them to unplug. If anyone out there is out there, unplug. And then the defense attorneys continue to want discovery on this episode, and the defense attorneys continue to argue for information on it. And what they learn leads one of them to tell me, many months later, the story's written, with his name attached, that was the CIA on the other end of the button. Hmm. How he knows that, why he knows that, I can't tell you. This is the thing about the Gina Haspel and the and so many things that go on in Guantanamo. As a reporter, you want to be able to demonstrate that it's more than someone saying something. But if it's going to be someone saying something and there's no second source, they've got to say it with their name attached. That's the way I report. But the reason I report, which is what I wanted to talk to you about, was the Miami Herald decided that if the Bush administration was going to build a court and a prison out of reach of the American people, it would not be out of reach of American journalism. The American media industry is not committing to that level of detail of coverage to almost any story anymore. We cover this story so far as a full-time commitment because it is an American enterprise. It is not the Pentagon's court and the Pentagon's prison. The United States did this. The United States owns this. Readers should be able to know what's going on down there. It's the right thing to do. And so if I don't do it, somebody should do it, right? I think both you and the Miami Herald deserve so much credit. I want to make sure that we explain to people what's going on in the trial and case of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. You've continued to report on his case. Explain a bit about his journey, how he ended up there, what we know about his alleged involvement in 9-11, and also the challenges and the difficulties that his legal defense team has been facing. The bottom line is he gets captured in March 2003. Pakistani authorities have finally found Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. A joint Pakistani-U.S. operation led to Mohammed's arrest. Authorities believe he's the mastermind behind the September the 11th terrorist attacks. He's carried off to a series of black sites. We know that he gets waterboarded 183 times. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was strapped to a board, tilted head down, a cloth placed over his face, and water poured over his mouth to give the sensation of drowning. But Rodriguez tells Stahl that Mohammed was tough. They had to pour the water more than 180 times. We know that he arrives at Guantanamo a U.S. military officer acting as his representative reads a statement by KSM in which he says, I ran the 9-11 operations from A to Z. And that takes place in 07. He's currently facing trial with four other men, a capital trial, death penalty trial, on charges and an arraignment that happened in May 2012. During the Bush administration, there was a failed effort to mount a trial. They wanted to plead guilty, they say. They didn't allow him them to plead guilty. The military commissions is created by Congress doesn't allow someone at a death penalty case to say, yeah, I did it, kill me now. The argument would be that the CIA so thoroughly programmed them to own up to behavior, it's not a valid confession that comes later because we are incapable of knowing what's truth and what's been planted. We are way in the pretrial proceedings. There is no trial date. We're on our second judge. So much of what the defense attorneys have been doing is arguing for access to information that the CIA won't give them because they're considered national security secrets. And so what's gone on for these years is this kind of balancing act. Do you want justice or do you want to keep your secrets? Can you have both? What should defense attorneys who have top secret clearances and can't tell the public but can tell a judge with a top secret security clearance, what are they entitled to know? Well, the CIA has basically said over and over again, we won't let them know it. This is an ambitious death penalty trial in an expeditionary setting. 
using a law that was just created and has never handled a death penalty case. I don't have any idea when we're going to get to even discussion of jury assembly. Getting there has been so complicated by location, the nature of the new court, and frankly, that those three and four years when they took the defendants and disappeared them into the dark sites rather than taking them to New York City and charging them in federal court. What does it mean that Guantanamo is still open, holding prisoners? Is this prison as we have known its existence post 9-11, is it ever going to close? Because Congress has said that you can't move them to the United States and forbidden anyone who's held as a detainee at Guantanamo to be transferred to the United States for any reason, for trial, for detention, for medical care, the reality is it sounds very much like it'll exist until the last detainee dies and they can shut it down. If you hold people as indefinite detainees in the war on terror, don't charge them with crimes. Or if you have a lifetime convict like Ali Hamza Balul, it doesn't go away. Many of these men aren't chargeable. They're not accused of being criminals. They're accused of being foot soldiers for a enemy force, for, which currently has no leader to surrender. You know, that's the way wars end. So if you're asking how Guantanamo ends, I have no idea. What is Guantanamo today? Guantanamo today is 40 detainees, one of them convicted, and a revolving force of about 1,400 U.S. troops, mostly National Guard, coming down there without family on nine-month tours, going to the beaches and bars of the base on weekends, and then going home and going back to their lives. And it's a temporary prison which really has no capacity to be shut down. Well, Carol, I want to thank you very much for all of the incredible work that you've done and the dedication that your colleagues uh, and editors at the Miami Herald had very, very early on in this story. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Carol Rosenberg is the only reporter covering Guantanamo full time. She's been doing this work for many years at the Miami Herald. She was recently hired by The New York Times, and she's going to continue to report on Guantanamo.